Hey, it's Robert Phoenix, and it's that time of month again. It's the new moon, and it's one of my favorite times because I get to hang out with Heather Elin. Hi, Heather. Hi, Robert. I'm so excited to do this with you again, and we're like in the middle of it this time because we're a little late. <laughs> we That's have right. some the two, the two chaos. <laughs> the, the two Virgos just don't have it together this month. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hang out with you guys for the next 60 minutes. We're gonna do a bit of a recap. Uh, an election recap and get into some interesting issues um, that were part of the election that, you know, when the election happened, that moon was just still balsamic. It still hadn't become new. Now we're dealing with the new moon today. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about that, where we are, um, and some of the, you know, mundane elements that have evolved out of that. And uh, then we're going to get into uh, the upcoming full moon. Heather, you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, so I mean, we have a crazy lunar cycle um, this month coming up because we have this new moon in Scorpio, which is really intense. It's actually in a nice time with Neptune, and I feel like the fallout from the election, you know, here in the United States wasn't as crazy as it could have been. And I think that's part of that. That is because the new moon in Scorpio is in that nice trine with Neptune softening things up a little bit. We have Jupiter entering Sagittarius. We have the nodes changing signs today. That actually happened. We have Mars, um, or we have Mars entering Pisces. We have Venus stationing direct. We have Mercury going retrograde. We have a full moon in Gemini and a T square with Mars. So this is going to be a jam packed sort of um, <laughs> astrological month. I think there's going to be a lot of shifting going on um, in the astrology, and we've already started that. We've already seen a lot of that this week. Um, and like you said, we just had the midterm elections here in the United States. I know that people sometimes get a little irritated when we center our, our conversation on the U.S., but I think this is going to, you know, branch off into more of a global conversation because one of the things that we have going on right now is the uh, the North Node just shifted into the sign of Cancer, you know, and that was going on as the elections here were taking place. We had the nodes shifting from this, uh, the sign of Leo, which is more about the patriarchy, the king, right, the emperor, um, and moving into the sign of Cancer. And one of the things that happened here in the United States is that we saw a huge influx of women taking seats of power and positions of authority in the United States government, which, you know, on one level is really wonderful to see. I mean, <laughs> being a woman, I love to see something like that. It feels, you know, very empowering on sort of a superficial level at least um, but on the other hand you know there's I think that there's more going on behind the scenes that we're maybe not um, aware of just yet and so you know if you want to we can kind of get into that with the new moon um, yeah why don't why don't we do this if you can you want to share a screen and yes let's look at either the uh, where we are now or you know election night so that way we can kind of riff off this well, this, oh, is, this is the uh, the new moon when it came exact, which was at 9 a.m. this morning. And mm -hmm. so... Go, thought, go back to the election chart. I want to look at that for a minute. Um, I don't have the election chart, actually. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I... Okay. Yeah. So I do, and I... and I, so it's, on my, it's on my website if you want to look at it. Okay. Um, but one of the things that... Uh, and this was... And I, and I cast the chart for 11 p.m., um, Eastern Standard Time, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was very interesting um, about that moment in time is that if you look at it, and you can even see some of this here with this chart. It's like a classic bowl chart in some ways. Mm -hmm. And last night it was even a bit tighter because at, uh, at 11 o'clock, I believe the ascent, the midheaven was – right around like one Taurus and Uranus was at 29, right okay. around 11 PM. So it was a classic bowl chart. And you know, what we see with the bowl chart is one side is open and one side is, is full. And there is a symmetry to it in some ways that the bowl chart kind of brings to your attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, you know, what we saw last night was a type of symmetry that took place. You know, on the one hand, uh, the Senate got more robust on the GOP side. Mm -hmm. They actually gained members now. Uh, on the other side, the on the House, the House became uh, Democratic, which, by the way, there's a, there's a history of the House flipping after, after two years. It almost always happens with any standing president. It's very rare that presidents will, will keep the House after two years. So it, it did happen. So we have, on the one hand, sort of the, the you know, the, the blue wave, which was supposed to 
hit and take over crash on Texas in, in other parts of the country. It didn't quite happen. Yeah. Although I, I would call it kind of like a blue tide <laughs> and that there, there was enough, you know, influence interpenetration that it did make a difference on, on the House side. On the Senate side, clearly uh, the Republicans and the GOP strengthened their position. What's really interesting about this is that every senator who voted, who was up for re-election and who voted against uh, Kavanaugh did not get reelected. So, and one of those people was Claire McCaskill and she shrugged it off like it's not a big deal, whatever. So this is, this is one of the reasons why the Senate got stronger. So I'm not saying that it entirely represents this half and half sort of, you know, sort of pie segmentation, but it's kind of interesting that, you know, we got half, one half, and we got another half. And, you know, where we go from here is going to be quite interesting and in a lot of ways, right? You know, Trump is a Gemini with that sun Uranus conjunction mm -hmm. and the true note in Gemini. So, so a lot of ways, this was kind of a Gemini like midterm, you know, it was sort of half and half and segmented and, um, one side felt like, well, you know, clearly we won over here. Another side could claim victory and say, clearly we won over here. And there were high-level candidates that didn't win here in Texas. Beto O'Rourke, you know, who had $70 million behind him, he didn't win. But the race was so close that if you're a Democrat, you could say, well, that's great. He almost beat Ted Cruz. He could go back to El Paso and work on becoming president. So this election kind of typifies, in some ways, the bull chart, but also that weird kind of Gemini on steroids thing that Trump has been about since he's been in office. So I just, you know, that's one thing I wanted to just bring up. The other is that when we get to that 29th degree of Uranus and Aries, there's like no energy left. Mm -hmm. you know, so this kind of revolutionary putsch that we've all experienced in the last seven years. There was like, there was, you know, yeah, a lot of people were voting and it was a record turnout if I'm not mistaken, but we didn't get that kind of hardcore revolutionary vibe. There were no, there were no people in the streets that were rioting. Mm -hmm. there, were no, there was, you know, it wasn't like out of control. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Uranus was at the 29th degree and there's just, there's just nothing, nothing left. And the node thing is very interesting, um, which you brought up around around cancer. Mm -hmm. Last night I, I was watching uh, CBS really briefly, and I could have sworn that I was watching. I mean, the characters, the cast of characters were different, but I could have sworn I was watching The View. I mean, this, this was you know CBS's election coverage. It was f like five women. I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And they focused intensely on this woman, Stacey Abrams. Is that her name? She's the Democratic candidate from Georgia mm. who is not conceded. The election, so close, she, she hasn't conceded. So that's going to be a very interesting um, piece to kind of look at. And again, that 29th degree of cancer, which is interesting because the nodes go backwards. Yeah. And, and so now there's not a lot of energy, but as it moves through, we'll tend to pick up more and more and more. So yeah. I'm not sure how successful she's going to be. Uh, you, you never know. I mean, I mean, the New York Times has crowned her the, the winner of the, of the election, but they've got to go through a whole process with that. And here in Texas, there was a woman, a young woman who unseated a long-term Republican uh, in a district just outside of Houston. Uh, so this, this piece with like the, you know, you know, cancer, cancer rising, this feminine energy rising, I think is going to be very real, mm -hmm. but I don't think any, it's kind of like when we were dealing with Leo. I mean, there are some markers there. You can see the markers and the markers address themselves on a mundane level, mm -hmm. but it's not like any one particular group per se dominated that. We saw a bunch of stuff with kids for better or worse, mm -hmm. right? We saw all the stuff with, you know, um, March for Our Lives. And we were talking about this earlier. 
with David Hogg and the high school kids. And that's, that's all Leo. That's all like true no stuff. And whether or not that was valid or real or important, clearly there was energy there. Uh, the energy was being tapped into and it was a, it was a part of our, you know, story. We're going to see something similar with women moving forward. And I think we're going to get a number of different stories. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be really interesting and empowering and some of which we're going to look at and actually ask, you know, what's going on here? What's the bigger picture? Mm -hmm. um, and, and is there some kind of dance going on between the South node and the North node that we, we yeah. need to pay close attention to? <laughs> and that's the thing that, um, that I think is quite interesting. So something that I kind of wanted to touch on and talk about is, um, how this relates to a prediction not made by me, but made by a woman named Penny Kelly in a book that she wrote called Robes. And I read this prediction and I thought it was quite interesting. And what she had said was that between uh, 2018 and 2021, especially, we would see an influx of women taking seats of power in the United States government and the world government, really, like everywhere in the world, we'd see more and more women taking positions of power. And we would all think this is a really good, really wonderful thing because, you know, of course, it, on some levels it is. But the reason that she said that these women would be taking seats of power is because the men who could very easily um, using, you know, their, because they already have these positions of power they've been in these seats for quite some time they know what's going on behind the scenes they have that influence they have that money um you know whatever it is they could take these positions but they're choosing to take a step back because they see what's happening in the government and they see how things are unraveling from behind the scenes and so women will be stepping up will think it's a good thing will think it's like an empowerment type of thing but really what's going on is that the men are stepping back and the women are taking the seat of power and her prediction was that um, when everything crumbles and falls apart women women will be um, take in these positions of power and they'll be used as the scapegoats so they'll be the ones in power and everything falls apart and so that is um, something that I'm kind of wondering about here with these elections because it falls in line with these predictions and that's very much you know a north and south node type of thing in the signs of cancer and Capricorn and as much as I hate to you know think that something like that would happen it's it's very much in alignment with the way things have gone throughout history right women as the scapegoats especially because so many minority women have been taking um, positions of power in the government record numbers of minority women um, you know in this in these midterm elections and so, you know, minority women as the scapegoats, women as scapegoats, this is not a new thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I, on one level, I think it's really good to have, you know, this feminine energy, this greater balance in, in the government and all that. Not that I think that the government really has as much influence and power as we think it does. Um, but on the other hand, I'm wondering if there's something going on a little bit more sinister. And so that's, that's the point that I wanted to bring up, because it does actually seem to be in alignment with the energy of the astrology right now and what's going on here. Yeah, that's a really interesting aspect. That's an interesting um, piece of information. And, you know, I, I think it feels right to me on, on, on some level. Mm -hmm. um, I. Look, I, I feel like just in general, um, we tend to be manipulated at almost every turn, or at least yeah. there's some kind of influence in our environment that wants to manipulate us, whether it's buying something or whether it's um, adopting an ideology, whatever that is, right? And it feels like now, um, especially because we had all this fire and energy in Leo for the last year and a half, roughly, um, that people got extremely fired up. You know, we had Uranus in the final degrees of, of Aries. And people are kind of raw and they're looking in some ways, you know, for, I wouldn't say, a, you know, salvation, but they're, they're, they've been tweaked. People have been tweaked to a point where I don't think it's that, on one level, I don't think it's that hard to get people to buy into a story mm -hmm. and then manipulate them in some direction. Yeah. I think there's another group of people who have kind of gone down that path already and they're stepping back and they're, they're like seeing things kind of, you know, maybe a, a kind of a larger picture or a larger view. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a famous quote by a, by Yates. It's from the, the poem, the second coming, which is uh, uh, in the end, the worst, are filled with passion and intensity. 
Well, the best lack all conviction. And I, and I feel like what he's referring to is he's referring to this place where everybody's all fired up and they're passionate. And, but it, when that happens, you know, we're easily moved. And so I think what we're seeing here potentially is tapping into that emotional cord mm -hmm. that women represent. That's what women represent an emotional cord, no matter who they are, right? And we all have women in our lives, mothers, girlfriends, daughters, wives, whatever, partners. So when, when what we're going to be seeing with the true note in cancer is the sounding of that emotional cord. And who better to sound that emotional cord than women themselves? So, and I, and I think that to your point, yes, it's a, it, you know, it's a very interesting and a very empowering time in a lot of ways. But at the same time, it's also like, you know, maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit and make sure that, you know, either these women are, you know, informed or the very least taking care of business in our own lives. So we're not, you know, we're, 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 we're not going down the same path. Yeah. Today I talked about this whole thing around demoralization. And, and one of the things that I think is important is, for us to maintain our emotional content without becoming completely detached. I think that's really the dance. Maybe that's where the nodes will come into play here. Yeah, absolutely. And getting more, I think, in touch with ourselves on like that core emotional level more in a way that's more real, right? Because right now we're being manipulated emotionally by like the media and by all of these different things that are at play. And, you know, I'm hoping that the North Node in Cancer will help us to get in touch with what's real on that emotional level, right? And what's more close to home, like we talked about in the webinar, like our safety, our security, our comfort zones, the people around us, our family, our community, you know, looking at um, emotion on a more local, individual um, sort of level, as opposed to, you know, all of this emotional manipulation that's going on from the outside. Um, that's kind of what I'm hoping will happen, at least. Yeah, you know, Cancer is very protective. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's super protective. And I think to your point, um, yeah, people, if they can bring that energy in, be protective about, you know, what they, what they let into their bodies, what they let into their minds, what they let into their hearts, you know, and the people around them. I think it's a really, it's a really good application. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of astrologers out there, a lot of people do videos. Invariably, people are going to hear about goddess energy as yeah. a result of this true note in cancer. You're going to hear this again and again and again, the rise of the goddess, the return of the goddess, mm -hmm. you know, so, and that's going to be part of what we're going to be sifting through and we know what that means and, um, and the truth of the validity or the reality around it, you know, so this is going to be a very, very interesting time. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Do you want to comment on the new moon at all? I mean, do you want to jump in there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we have the new moon that happened at the same time that the nodes were switching signs, which, um, you know, we, we got into pretty in depth here. And so the, the new moon was happening at 15 degrees Scorpio at 9 a.m. this morning, so it just passed. Uh, but we're still in that new moon phase all the way until sometime in the afternoon tomorrow. Um, and so, yeah, so we had this really powerful new moon in Scorpio. The dark moon leading up to it was quite intense. And I think it's because all that sort of transitional energy was at play and it was kind of, you could feel it in the ethers, like you could cut through it, it was sick. Um, and, but this new moon itself is actually quite nice. I mean, it's in a really nice trine with Neptune and Pisces. And so, you know, I think it's bringing us back to a place of like compassion, connectedness, you know, um, idealism, like thinking more in a way that, so I, I think it's bringing a lighter sort of softer energy, even in the sign of Scorpio because of that really nice trine to Neptune. It's like a reset, a reset when it comes to, um, our ability to be compassionate, to be empathic, to sort of, um, connect with other people on that level. And I think we're seeing that in the aftermath of, you know, the midterm elections and all of that. And I think part of that is because of the way that it went, right? It couldn't have gone better in terms of sort of diffusing some of that divide and conquer energy, uh, because, you know, everybody got a little bit of what they wanted. It sort of split in half. It wasn't like a big landslide on one way or the other, which would have made things a lot more turbulent. Um, and so people, you know, are a little bit softer right now. They're not as like intense as, especially as they were yesterday. Oh my gosh. Everybody vote now, vote now. <laughs> yeah. There was, um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of edge, you know, <laughs> headed into the election. 
Yeah. yeah. So I, I think this diffused some of that energy. Um, and this new moon in Scorpio is really good for t tapping into our psychic energy, right? Type, tapping into doing some like introspection, some internal work. Um, that's all that very Scorpionic stuff. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to talk a little bit about that Scorpio energy too, I know we're both Scorpio rising. And so this is sort of a really nice new moon for, I would say both of us. <laughs> You know, the thing I love about Scorpio energy um, is, the, is this whole, like, feeling and vibe of aftermath. You know, like, after the event, you know, after the fire or whatever it is. There, you know, it's like when somebody passes away that you're close to, you have this kind of connection to them that that that's, you know, falls into this aftermath space. And it's very peaceful and it's very healing and it can be very deep and very profound. And to me, this typifies sort of one of the greatest um, characteristics of Scorpio is this feeling of aftermath. And it's like you've gone through something. You know, there's, there's like, you know, it's not quite a purge, but you've gone through something. And part of you has either died or divested from something that's been important. And it's this quiet, peaceful, sense of aftermath with Scorpio that I think is really profound. And we have, it feels like we have some of this right now. You know, I mean, we're all biosensors. We can all feel the world around us. And post this election, it, it's like, you know, we got through it. You know, people, you know, didn't die. We didn't, we didn't go after each other. There's no burning in the streets. Yeah. Um, you know, the, again, to your point, everybody kind of got what they wanted on some level. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would have been nice if they'd done this. Or the, but at the end of the day, it's like about as close to a win-win as possible. Yeah. And so now that that's behind us, we're in the aftermath. You know, we're in that aftermath energy. And that trying with Neptune, I think is great. Now, one of the things that is important when we get into a new moon is that you can set things up, right? You can set the energy. Yeah. Go into the energy and really feel the energy. So, you know, what's your commitment for the next – uh, 14 days. Will you be kinder to people, more gentle to people? Can you let go of things that aren't that important to you? Um, do you always have to win? Do you always have to get the last word on social media? I mean, you know, these are some of the energies that I think that are available. And it's not like Scorpio is a really strong sign. It is not a sign that's a wallflower or pushover. So when we get into this, it's not like we're surrendering or being submissive. Potentially, it comes from a real feeling, of, a, a real position of strength and power. So that's kind of how I'm interpreting the new moon, the trine with Neptune, uh, and, and just the sense that we got through something. And now we're in the aftermath phase. And it feels, to me personally, it feels a lot more peaceful than it did 48 hours ago. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I, li I like that interpretation and I agree with you. And so this is like a really good time to set those types of intentions. Um, and then so kind of moving on past the new moon, um, we're having Jupiter actually. So right now with the new moon, um, we have Jupiter at 29 degrees in the sign of Scorpio. So it's like, it's like ending its transit through Scorpio right now. So there's a lot of Scorpio energy um, at play. And it's actually in, in conjunction with Uranus. You would think that this would be maybe some sort of rebellious, <laughs> um, you know, sort of sort of energy of like some sort of like drastic change or something like that. Or maybe it's a suppression of rebellion, right? Or suppression of wanting to change something or move into a place of freedom. But anyway, so Jupiter is going to be moving into the sign of Sagittarius in less than 24 hours. And so that's another big shift that's going on this week. And that's actually a really positive one as well. So we had a lot of intensity the first part of the week and then all of a sudden this energy has shifted and now we're having Jupiter move into Sagittarius which is its home sign it does really well there so we're moving kind of into a place where we're expanding on integrity we're expanding on morality we're expanding on um you know adventure and <laughs> and social consciousness and connectedness to like other countries and other places in the in the world and higher knowledge higher wisdom broader perspective we're getting that broader perspective back too because Jupiter and Scorpio is very hyper focused on whatever whatever it's focused on in the moment right and so the kind of balance to that is moving into the sign of Sagittarius where we're able to see the bigger picture we're able to see like the forest for the trees or however you want to 
uh, phrase that. And so, yeah, and that's another thing we talked about really in depth in the webinar. So you guys, I'm going to post a link to the webinar in the description below because a lot of these shifts that are occurring, you know, today and tomorrow, we went really in depth and, and these are going to be affecting us more than just this week and this month. It's going to be for like a year, year and a half. Um, but yeah, so do you want to say anything about Jupiter moving into Sagittarius and how that's sort of influencing us this month? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, again, seven-year period uh, from 20, 2011 to uh, 2018, Uranus and Aries, and, and a lot of people got real real self-oriented, self-involved, you know, mm -hmm. the radical expression of the self. And one of the things that we heard during that time is, well, this is my truth. It's my truth, right? Didn't really matter if it was true or not. But yeah. it was true to them, <laughs> you know? And we could have been the most stupid, outlandish, ignorant thing, but it was their truth, right? And that's part of the awakening process, I, I believe. Right? Um, but with Jupiter and Sagittarius, it's not just about your truth anymore. Jupiter and Sagittarius is about a bigger truth. And I think there's a lot of potential to be gained. Like, I think there's real spiritual gold to be mined with Jupiter and Sagittarius. And I think we're at a time where if people can get over beyond like their truth, they mm -hmm. can tap into a greater truth, something that allows them to maybe let go of a lesser truth that they cling to because it feels good or keeps them from being afraid. And they can be lifted up and see things from a, a completely different perspective. And I'm all for this. I think we, like Jupiter and Sagittarius couldn't have come sooner. It's like it's right on time for us. Yeah. Because I feel like we can all expand into a spiritual realm that is greater than who we are, but at the same time represents dimensions of us simultaneously, right? So it is who we are, but it's greater than who we are. So it's a paradox, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think for people that are invested in it, it could be, this can be a great, great year. So don't, don't hang on or hang out for a lesser truth. Be willing to step up and expand your vision. You know, this is, this is going to be a great year for that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, we have that to look forward to for, you know, all of 2019 pretty much as well. So I think Jupiter and Sagittarius is going to kind of be the saving grace here with all of this Capricornian sort of uh, energy that's going to be going on with Saturn and Pluto and the South Node all coming into all these different crazy conjunctions with the eclipses and all that. I think Jupiter and Sagittarius is going to help us to uh, maintain a certain level of perspective and optimism throughout, you know, what could potentially be quite a bit of turbulence on a global and individual scale, like level. Um, so yeah, yeah, I like that Jupiter and Sagittarius energy. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to reiterate too, what, you know, Heather talked about the webinar and we, we went into Jupiter and Sagittarius in really great detail. And there's gonna be a period where Jupiter is gonna square Neptune. Yeah. And we don't, I don't really wanna get into it because we get into it a lot in that webinar. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, Heather will have a link. And there's so much information there that you, you may wanna avail yourself of it. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of Neptune, that kind of brings me to some of the other energy that's going on. <laughs> Because Mars is entering Pisces um, next week, actually, on the 15th. We have Mars sextiling Uranus and then moving right into Pisces. Um, and that's where it's going to start to conjunct, you know, at the very end of the month, Neptune. But in general, Mars moving into Pisces can be a little bit of a difficult energy because Mars doesn't tend to do very well in Pisces. Um, you know, Mars is action. It's the willpower. It's our volition. It's our ability. It's what motivates us, right? And so, um, you know, Mars and Pisces can represent like apathy, lack of motivation. It can bring a lot of confusion about what action to take. Um, you know, I know in the birth chart, it can bring issues with willpower, with um, being fantasizing about taking action instead of actually taking action. It can bring issues with your immune system, your muscles, right? Your ability to actually uh, physically act because maybe you're too sick or you don't have the energy. Uh, those types of issues but you know on a global scale I feel like there's not going to be it's just there's like a lack of energy there right people aren't going to be so up in arms and people are going to be it brings a lot of confusion as well <laughs> on a lot of different levels yeah 
you know, Mars went into Pisces right after Trump got elected yeah. back in, in 2016. And talk about a confusing time. Oh, we're going to flip the delegates. Oh, we're, we're going to go into a voter recall. I mean, you know, it's just moving through this, you know, morass and this, this fog of, you know, we just had an event. Now, now it's not so clear where things are going, you know. So mm-hmm. we're going to see some of this again on some level, on a mundane level. And one of the things that has been talked about is that, you know, in the House, they're going to waste no time at all to try to go into, you know, Trump's background, his taxes. And look, here's the deal. I mean, if they really wanted to, they could find so many things to hang Trump from. The problem is, is that most of these people have either done business with them, with him, or they've done things just as bad. And there's, you know, a, a, a serious amount of dirt on any number of people that are, you know, going to try to shine a light on the president. So I, I think it's going to be difficult. And, and I think that the motivations will not be very clear. I mean, that's going to be another thing with uh, Mars and Pisces. And by the way, again, I'm just going to talk about Trump a little bit, his chart, and I'm going to drop into the personal. But Mars is going through his seventh house. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be interesting and tricky to watch what mm-hmm. happens with his partnerships his relationships um we're going to talk about this he basically fired just fired jeff sessions and that's a partnership we'll talk about that it's already starting to happen but the other thing too is that mars is going to try all of his cancerian planets you know he's got venus and mercury and saturn all in cancer so this could be a very interesting time for him in terms of tapping into other people's emotions, the Vox Populi, um, you know, he may, the way, the way Trump sort of works it out, he always somehow weirdly comes out on top. And that may or may not be due to his chart. It could be by the people that are backing him, but he always seems to come out on top. And it feels like this phase with Mars is indicative of a, a subtle power or subtle energy that he's going to pick up on and channel. And I know a lot of people who are very into Trump (laughs) have wanted him to get rid of Sessions for a long time. And now it's happening. And, you know, it's going to speak to them. Now, from a personal level, you know, I think one of the best applications for Mars and Pisces is to do good works, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, want to give of yourself, Mm -hmm. if you want to do something charitable, um, Mars and Pisces is a great energy for that. So a lot of people talk about change. A lot of t- people talk about, um, you know, having a better world or, you know, well, this is a great, this is a great time, you know, get into some of this Mars and Pisces energy, look around your community, look around your family, you know, where can you be charitable? Where can you give? You know, I think it's great. Also, it's a creative energy too. So if we have any artists out there, Mars and Pisces can be very, very creative. Now the conjunction with Neptune, you were talking about this earlier, and you had some interesting insights on shootings as it relates yeah. to the Mars and Neptune. You wanna talk about that? So um, I've noticed this pattern, right? And so this is specific to here in the United States and these sort of uh, mass shootings that we tend to have. And I've noticed that when we have squares or oppositions uh, between Mars and Neptune, we've been having these really big mass shootings where there's a lot of confusion, a lot of that sort of false flag conspiratorial energy floating around. Everybody's very confused about what's going on. There's a very obvious uh, disconnect between like the official story and what's floating around on the internet and what people are saying and what the actual uh, sort of eyewitnesses and people on the ground are saying. So there's all sorts of craziness and chaos and confusion around these specific events that are tied to Mars and Neptune. And so we're about to have, and so, you know, I I don't make a lot of mundane predictions because I, you know, I'm still working on learning how to do that as good as you do, Robert. Um, But I have, I have in my head and sometimes out loud predicted these, these shootings as they're happening because of these Mars Neptune aspects. And so what I'm thinking is with Mars moving into the sign of Pisces, Mars rules guns, Neptune is confusion, delusion, illusion, uh, lies, deception, deceit. 
Mars coming into a conjunction with Neptune could very much uh, bring about some sort of false flag, flag event, especially involving, you know, guns, violence, uh, mass shooting, something along those lines. And that's actually going to come exact December 7th. But we're having Sun Square Neptune December 5th. So I would say beginning of December um, would be a time period to sort of watch out for. So the end of this lunar month, really, and during the dark moon, especially, I think that's going to be kind of an interesting time. Yeah, I think that was a great, great notice on, uh, on your side. And I, I remember talking about uh, the Mars-Neptune square with the Parkland event and, yeah. um, and Nicholas Cruz and David Hogg and, you know, that whole thing. I mean, what people that follow my work know that, um, that I'm very dubious and very skeptical of these events for mm -hmm. a number of reasons, um, primarily because my experience around being so intensely involved with looking into 9-11 and the chart of 9-11 and everything past 9-11 has led me to believe that, you know, these events are used to traumatize people yeah. and then trigger them and then make, make us more malleable um, in many ways, more controllable. So, um, you know, when I, hear, when I hear that, to me it sounds like, a, you know, we're looking at potentially a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. with a Mars-Neptune conjunction. So, you know, all you assholes out there that are planning on doing something, we're on to you. Right? <laughs> we are on to you. That's true. We are. We're starting to pick up on these patterns here a little bit more easily. And um, and there's going to be, I mean, we have a lot of stuff going on. Like Mercury is going to be retrograde around that time too uh, in the side of Sagittarius. And it's actually going to be retrograding back into the score, into sign of Scorpio at the beginning of December. So there's, I mean, there's potential for a lot of confusion, I would say, at the start of the month. Um, so that's well, definitely- Well, we're retrograding back into Scorpio, would be really good for research and looking yes. at- Yes, people are gonna see through it, right? When you get that Scorpio energy, people are really gonna be doing their due, due diligence and you know, getting to the bottom of these things. Yeah, yeah, good, excellent. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we, need, we need more citizen journalists and citizen investigators and- researchers, because, you know, clearly our media on many levels has failed us. And, yeah. and each and every one of us has the ability. We got great tools at our disposal. We use enough discernment, logic, and a little bit of intuition. You can open up a lot of doors. So that's all available to us. And, you know, and Jupiter and Sagittarius, by the way, will actually help that, right? There'll mm -hmm. be people will get excited. It's like, it's because when you get into it, when you really start to put things together, there's almost a spiritual high to it. It's really, yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting, you know? Especially and for it, like Scorpio risings. <laughs> yeah, especially Scorpio. We really get off on that, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, that's a, I mean, that was a great call. And so when I, you know, when I look at the timing around something like that, you know, I'm thinking, you know, Christmas, malls, you know, that's kind of, yeah. Where my head goes. And if you notice, there's a pattern with most of these events. I'd say 99% of them uh, take place inside. Like if there's a shooting, it's inside. It's not outside. Just remember that. Yeah. So I, I guess, I guess um, just buy all your stuff from Amazon and don't go to the mall. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, yeah. But, I, but, but great catch on that. Thank you. I mean, we'll see <laughs> how it pans out. I hope it doesn't pan out like that, but you know, these things tend to happen in these cycles. Um, and so th the other thing that we should kind of talk about too is obviously the full moon that's happening, which is going to be occurring just after Mercury goes retrograde. So we can get into the Mercury retrograde and that full moon in Gemini if you want to, because the full moon in Gemini is kind of a weird one. Um, it's at zero degrees in the sign of Gemini. So the most intense Gemini energy and Gemini also has an association with deception, trickery, <laughs> that type of thing too. Totally. Um, so I'll get the chart up for that one right here. Um, and so, yeah, on the 22nd of November, we have Mercury in retrograde. We have Jupiter, you know, already in Sagittarius. Uh, the moon will be conjunct Jupiter, wide conjunction with Mercury retrograde. And then we're going to have that opposition, obviously, with the moon in the sign of Gemini at zero degrees, just moved into the sign of Gemini. And then if you look here, there's a T-square forming with Mars in Pisces, right? And so this could be another point of sort of activation of that Mars, Pisces, Neptunian energy, because, I mean, that's quite intense. This is a lot like the election night chart at 11 p.m. in Washington, D.C. Really? Leo rising, 
Uh, the midheaven was around one. You got 29 degrees. Uranus, I mean, Venus was still in the same place. Yeah. So it was very interesting. Mars, Aquarius in the seventh house. Now it's moved up a little bit. It's interesting. You know, is there some ramification or some connection to this chart and what happened on election night? Question mark? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's, right at the, it's right there at the full moon. Oh, you're right. I mean, Gemini, like, I think there are three signs that are really, really good at spy craft. It's Gemini, Scorpio, and Pisces. Gemini, yeah. because you can take on another identity. Scorpio, because you can keep a secret. Yeah. And Pisces, because, well, if they want to, they can probably just wipe your memory and just won't, won't remember it, right? No, I'm <laughs> But Pisces is very malleable and can allow people to take on other identities. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're a, like a, a Pisces with a Scorpio rising and a Gemini moon, uh, please apply to uh, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, Langley, Virginia. Uh, they'd be happy to take you on, no doubt. Do you think they do that? Do you think they look at people's charts in the CIA? You know, I wonder that because I've had clients who have had affiliations with the CIA. I had one in particular that was like interviewed to work with like the FBI or something like that, but didn't end up taking the job. And like, they have these types of placements. Like it's very literal. Like if you have a ton of Gemini, a ton of Scorpio, you know, Pluto conjunct your son or something, you know, you might work for the CIA. So <laughs> I had a client that worked for the FBI. Well, she was briefly a client that worked for the FBI. Um, yeah, so let's look at this full moon. Yeah, we got a we got a we got a Mars square going on. And it's that I mean to me this full moon Mars square is like I'm not crazy about it. I have to say, you know, just not. You know, I think on an individual level, this would be kind of more like a challenge to take some sort of action, right? So when you're looking at the moon, it's the culmination point of something that you obviously seeded in a previous cycle or at the start of this lunar cycle. And so it's like we're at this culmination point, this point of release, this point of potentially celebration, but there's some sort of challenge going on here where we need to take action on something that maybe, you know, wasn't acted on at the start of the cycle, which was the election night. So there could be actually something, you know, going on with the midterm elections and the need to change something or challenge something that could Indeed. come up. Um, but yeah, I would say that this is going to, it's going to challenge us to take some sort of action. It's, there's, some, there's some sort of emotional frustration going on, you know, with this new moon because it's the moon. Or this yeah, moon. And you, and you, yeah, and there's no outs with this moon. You know, you got the square to Mars and the opposition to Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, yeah. and, you know, and, and, that, and that's it, right? There's not like uh, a trine or... <laughs> um, no, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no, no, no point of release. In, in, in many instances, you know, the son represents the father when we're young. You know, because when we're young, fathers play with us. They kind of act like kids. They roll around the floor, wrestle, right? So very playful, light, and sunny. But as the father gets older, the son, uh, the father resembles or takes on more Saturnian qualities. Becomes stricter, more rules. You, you know, this, this is kind of how it breaks down. The mood is always the mother. So here we have Mars scoring off against the feminine, the mother, and the and the son or the early son. So there's some very interesting implications mm -hmm. around parenting, um, around you know sort of the early patterning that we've had in our lives with mothers and fathers, and you know Mars and Pisces kind of wants to. It feels this energy feels petulant. There's a petulance that's connected to this T-square. It's kind of like, you know, dragging heels, stomping feet. And one of the things that, that Pisces is great at, um, and Pisces can be a wonderful sign, so please, I'm not denigrating Pisces. But we've looked at this before, and there's victimization and martyrdom that goes along with Pisces. And to me, this gets really close. This energy gets real close to victimization, like blaming others, blaming your mother, blaming your father, blaming whatever, right? Mars and Pisces can go there, and it's creeping up on that conjunction with Neptune. The one thing I will say about that Mars-Neptune conjunction, which you've already covered with the, the shooting stuff, is if something does go off the rails around that time, 
do not get wasted. Do not get high. Try to try to stay cool yeah. and don't open your channels. Okay. Yeah. Don't open your channels. That's because, what they want. Our channels wide open. That's right. That's absolutely right. So don't open your channels. You don't want to be thrown into such a state of despair or whatever, so that you just say fuck it. You know, don't go there. And it almost feels like a. Now that I'm looking at this a bit more, it feels like a bit of a test. It's what it feels like. Mm-hmm. It feels like we're going to be tested here with this uh, with this T squared. Mars moving closer to Neptune. I mean, I would go so far as to say, you know, for this whole end of November, start of December with all this, you know, Mars Neptune energy, like going back to what you said about not opening your channels, getting wasted and all that, all the holiday parties and all that. (laughs) People should try to, you know, maintain a certain level of control with all of this sort of Piscean, you know, difficult energy going on because, I mean, there's potential for people to go way overboard, to say things that they don't mean. You know, when you have Mars and Pisces, the anger that you've sort of suppressed and subdued and haven't let out, that's going to come out when you're drunk or when you're inebriated in some sort of way much more easily than it normally would. So you're going to be saying all sorts of stuff, um, especially if you're going to be, you know, particularly affected by that Mars placement, you know, based on whatever's going on in your chart. So, um, but yeah, in general, that would be a a good, good advice for the holiday season this year, I would think. You know, I was looking at the the uh, sextile to Uranus here. Yeah, and it's one of the more benevolent sort of um, aspects. And then there's that um, sextile. Well, it's really really wide to Pluto, um, but it feels to me like if you could take responsibility for your life at, at this time, on this full moon, whatever, right? Responsibility for what's happened, you know, during the cycle, during the lead up, during your life, that that sextile to Uranus can indicate that you can move through things very quickly, but you have to take responsibility for it. You if like the more blame that you place out there, um, the harder it's going to be. That sextile with Uranus is very interesting. Yeah. So on the full moon, you know, if you need to really, bear the burden of responsibility, do it because you can move through things very quickly. That's, that's my takeaway here. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I would say that that energy also, I mean, obviously it has to do with making like changes, right? Taking the initiative and taking the action that you need to make to take, to make the change that you need to make in your life as well. Um, so I think that there could be a lot kind of up in the air <laughs> during this time period for a lot of people with, you know, all of this, this energy, especially all this mutable energy, because this is like a mutable T-square going on. Um, so yeah, so do you want to get into the Mercury retrograde? Because that's sort of the last big thing piece to this puzzle of the lunar month is Mercury is going to be retrograding through Sagittarius and back into the sign of Scorpio. It's going to hit um, square with Mars. It's going to hit, um, I think it might be stationing actually in square with Neptune. And then it's going to hit, you know, a conjunction with Jupiter um, on and off throughout this time period of the shadow period, you know, into the retrograde and all of that. So what do you think that's going to bring for us in terms of what we're revisiting over this next month? Yeah, I think we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we've already gone through this fairly extended cycle with Venus retrograde, uh, Mars retrograde. We even had another Mercury retrograde. I mean, so these retrograde cycles have been really a part of our experience pretty intensely um, in 2018. And it feels like since, you know, this is going to be the last one that, um, it would be really, I think, empowering to look back on this entire year and how quickly the year has gone by and just do some personal inventory. Um, when we get into Scorpio, it's about other people's money. It's mm-hmm. about debt in some ways, resources. You know, I would take a hard look at some of that energy um, and what you can do to move forward and either protect yourself or alleviate. Um, some of that debt. The other thing too, with like Mercury and Scorpio, it's very penetrating and um, it's great for asking questions and going into depth psychology. So I I think that could be very, very helpful. 
And we've gone through a lot of stuff with Venus and Scorpio retrograding. So we've had to look at sort of the, 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 the DNA of our relationships, you know, power structures inside of relationships, who does what, who makes what, who has the power, who doesn't have the power and all that stuff. Right. So now it shifts from the relational level to the personal level. And again, you know, that's kind of, you know, taking more responsibility for oneself. Um, I think it's a good aspect, to be honest with you. Uh, it gets us maybe cleared and primed for, you know, the beginning of the year, 2019. Uh, I, you know, the squares and stuff, I just, I, it feels to me like, just for me personally, it's about unhooking programs. You know, mm -hmm. unhooking programs and, and trying not to get stuck or hung up on your past, you know, things you've done wrong, opportunities that you've missed, any of those things. And so now it's a time where you can kind of unhook it. And I, and I really feel like, again, with Jupiter and Sagittarius, we're going to have more opportunity to live in the present. And the present is really, it's really where it's at. And, um, and I feel like this Mercury retrograde can help kind of liberate us. Because Scorpio, you know, Scorpio is kind of dark and gothic in a lot of ways, too. And, and we can be haunted by the things that we didn't do, choices we didn't make or did make that didn't really work out for us. And, and, I feel, and it just feels like we're at a time collectively where, you know, we need to start dropping a lot of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's, a very good, um, that's a very good point. And, you know, Mercury retrograding back into the sign of Scorpio, <laughs> it's actually going to be sort of hitting that point at the start of December. But, I mean, it'll be kind of reaching that point. So we're going to be having Mercury retrograde while we're sitting sort of at the dinner table here in the United States for Thanksgiving and all of that. It's going to be squaring Mars. And <laughs> we're going to have this, like, you know, crazy energy going on here. So maybe, you know, this is a time to sort of see the bigger picture um, because it'll be retrograding, obviously, in the sign of Sagittarius. But seeing the bigger picture, having that broader perspective, um, not getting too intense about, you know, things when there's, like, arguments or political disputes or things that come up, <laughs> you know, yeah. with your family and all of that and in these discussions. So this would be a time to sort of take a step back and maybe um, – and also, you know, when you have Mercury and retrograde in the skies, it's much more introspective. So thinking before you speak, right? Uh, that's going to be a big thing. And especially in the sign of, of Sagittarius, Mercury and Sag or yeah, Mercury and Sagittarius is like, you just say things and it's not necessarily that you're saying it in a way that is malicious, but it's just, you know, it's people who have Mercury and Sagittarius, they're out, they're always putting their foot in their mouth. So maybe this is a time when we can be a little bit more introspective and we can think a little bit more before we speak. So we're not putting our foot in our mouth. Um, especially during this time where when we're going to be connecting with people in a way that, you know, is often difficult. People have difficult times. I'm connecting with their families and things like that. Family relationships can be a little bit trying for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, just taking a step back and seeing the bigger picture before you just say whatever you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and bust out the, the plastic silverware. <laughs> no sharp knives at the dinner table. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. You know, great point. Great point. Um, the other thing too, like if we get into this subject or topic about truth, right? Like what is true? Yeah. Truth. What is true? So we go into Mercury and Sagittarius. We think something is true, mm -hmm. theoretically. And then the retrograde in the Scorpio allows us yeah. to actually test the validity of that. Like yeah. <laughs> That's a very good point. Very interesting. Yeah. So good times in the world, huh? Yeah, it should be an interesting month. Um, yeah, so I think we pretty much covered a lot of what's going on this month. Do you have any final thoughts about anything? Well, I just wanted to talk about that set the sessions thing because we, you and I talked about it. Oh yeah, bit. yeah, Jeff Sessions. So Jeff Sessions just got fired like a couple hours ago, <laughs> or he resigned or whatever. Um, but yeah, so we can get into that real quick. Um, I have his chart here we don't have a birth time for him but he does have as we were talking about off camera a lot of capricornian energy with the sun mars and the moon there and so just as the nodes shifted and the south node moved into capricorn what happened we have, we have an uber capricorn checking out he's got that black moon lilith at zero capricorn see that conjunct his sun yeah <laughs> yeah so very interesting 
Um, because, you know, one of the things we're going to see, we're going to see some of these hierarchical institutional figures begin to kind of fall by the wayside. Uh, it's going to, so right out of the gate, 29 Capricorn, we have somebody who is in the halls of power, Washington, D.C., the attorney general, a Capricorn, mm -hmm. bowing out. Yeah. See you later. He bowed, but he bowed out two years ago. I mean, I mean, once he was named attorney general, he recused himself and basically hasn't been seen ever since. So, I mean, this is just a mere formality in some ways. But it's going to be very, this is, to me, it's emblematic of kind of what we can see mm -hmm. over the next year and a half, where this is headed. Absolutely. And what's interesting even more so about this is that like <laughs> we lost Jeff Sessions, right? Which as soon as I hear the name Jeff, Jeff Sessions, I think about cannabis, right? <laughs> I think about him, you know, wanting to, you know, go hard on cannabis and medical marijuana and all this type of stuff on the federal level and people having that backlash against him. And then what we saw in the elections were a whole slew of states, you know, um, that legalized recreational marijuana, including my home state of Michigan. Again, yay. Um, and so we saw like the end of prohibition in certain states. And that's another thing too, the North Node in Cancer. Cancer is the mother, mother earth, our connection with nature, right? And right. So decriminalizing nature. <laughs> that could be seen as a North Node in the sign of cancer type of thing. And then Jeff Sessions leaving, that's South Node in Capricorn, all coinciding at the same time. Yep. Absolutely. Did you know that they're, they're like looking at renaming Michigan now? Did you know that? No. Yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna, there's a, there's a measure to change the name from Michigan to Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Only a girl from Michigan would find that hilarious. I love it. It's great. That was a terrible joke, but it was really funny. I know, I know. What can I say? I only had a few seconds to think of it. <laughs> It was very good. You're quick on your on your toes. <laughs> it's like Jupiter and Sagittarius, man. <laughs> I'm high. I'm high in Jupiter and Sag. I love it. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> Who needs ganj? It's Jupiter and Sag, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I could go, I could do this for probably too long. Hey, this has been great, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you for doing this with me again, as we do every month. I always love reconnecting and doing these talks and I always learn a lot. And um, oh, speaking of which, uh, you're developing a webinar series that you're gonna be doing. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit about that, because I think people might be very interested. I'm interested, if I have time, I wanna attend this webinar. So, one, so uh, I, I'm putting together a syllabus for a course, it's going to be, it's a six week kind of ongoing, well, rolling webinar, try to start this in December, have a little break for the holidays and then take, take, take a, uh, kick it back in after the first of the year. And it's, and it's called thinking astrologically and beyond. So basically what it is, we're going to meet for uh, six weeks. It's not going to be super hardcore, like 90 minutes of your time on a Saturday and we're going to do this for six Saturdays. And if it goes well, we'll roll for another six after that. Uh, but the whole idea here is to look at uh, thinking astrologically, which is one of the things that when I work with somebody, I try to get, get them to think about and do, to think astrologically. Look at what's going on in the world, what's going on in your life, connecting dots. And when that happens, you get to see all these connections that open up. And then the mundane world of astrology becomes kind of this living, breathing um, sort of theater of our life, the backdrop of our life. Or sometimes it's even the front drop or the, the frontal exposure of our life. So it's not just that, but it's also thinking metaphorically, thinking mythologically. There's going to be mythopoesis, um, strange attraction, synchronicity. We're going to go through all this stuff so that at the end of this, people will be able to begin to look at the world, you know, at, at, from a much more kind of multi-tiered level. And so if you have interest in astrology and you're, you're a good astrologer, um, this could be a very interesting way for you to incorporate other ways of thinking and hardwired into what you do. 
And I'm really hoping that the group becomes experiential too, that when we get into this, we'll be able to see like how this stuff reverberates between our thoughts and sort of the collective mind. So that's my hope, whether or not it happens, we'll see, but that's a, so put that together and I'm going to, I'm going to launch that when Jupiter goes into Sag. So just a couple days from now, keep your eyes on my webpage and Facebook and I'll be talking about it on my shows. Yeah, absolutely. And once you have that up, I'll, you know, edit this and put the link down in the description below. But until then, you can go to robertphoenix.com. Uh, you can get the updates there. You can book a reading with Robert. You can take his 11th House Academy course, which is really awesome and really in-depth. Um, if you want to learn astrology and learn all of the basics and beyond that. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> that's where you can find Robert. You can find me at astrologywithheather.com. And we'll be back next month with another really exciting forecast for the month ahead. And until then, I hope you guys all have a really wonderful month. And thank you so much, Robert, for doing this again with me. Well, it's always my pleasure, Heather. And I want to thank everybody who shows up and, and, and watches our videos, whether you like them or not. Thanks for <laughs> <showing up. laughs> thank you.